Hello, and welcome everyone. In this podcast, we're going to begin talking about translation. The next several podcasts will be on translation. That is, how are we going to make a protein from the messenger RNA that we just made during transcription? We touched on a concept in when we were talking about transcription, this idea of one gene equals one enzyme. And this was a hypothesis first set up by the scientists Beetle and Tatum. And they did a lot of experiments to show that in their organism that they were working with, Neurospora, a kind of fungus, that they were seeing one gene is equal to one enzyme. And by and large, th this hypothesis holds up. But there are some exceptions, in fact, some really important exceptions. And I think we should at least mention them as we begin this conversation of translation. The first one is that they thought of genes coding enzymes, which they do, but it's also important to know that not all proteins are enzymes. So some proteins, so we can list this as genes encode proteins. Not just enzymes, but proteins. Many proteins contain multiple subunits. Proteins or enzymes, I should say. So for instance, the protein hemoglobin has four subunits. Two are identical, coded for by the same gene, and two are coded for by a different gene. So this one protein right here isn't made by one gene. It's made by two genes. This red one is coded for by a gene. This blue one is coded for by a gene. And this was hemoglobin. The third exception to this one gene equals one enzyme hypothesis is sometimes one gene encodes multiple proteins through a process called alternative splicing and RNA editing. We've already talked about RNA editing and we haven't really talked about alternative splicing yet, but we will. But that is how, in, in general, that is how those when those introns are removed, Sometimes you can remove exons with them, and in that process you will generate more proteins from the same gene. And the last one here is, is that some genes make RNA as their final product. So I'm not talking about messenger RNA, I'm talking about things like tRNA, ribosomal RNA. Those don't go on to make a protein, the RNA is the final product the SN RNA, the small nuclear RNAs that are important in the splicing of, me of introns. Those are not proteins, those just stay as RNA. So let's go ahead and erase this. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a messenger RNA that just came off of the gene from the, the RNA polymerase. And we always start with the 5' prime end. I'm just going to make some letters here and I'll explain them in a moment. We know that each of these are a codon, and that each of these will make an amino acid. We'll come back to, in the next podcast, about how we determine this actual sequence, that this codon made a specific amino acid, as well as how we reason that the codon had to be three nucleotides long. But each of these are a codon. So the question now is, how do we read this? And to read it, you need to have a genetic code with you. So here's our good friend, the genetic code. I want to make sure I point out a, a few features on it. First, I want to show how you read it. For instance, if we wanted to read this codon, ACU, what you would do is you would look on this column for your first one, so A, and then you'd want to look up here for your second one, C, so we know it's got to be one of these four here. And then the third letter, U, is here. We follow that over here, and so we know it's ACU here. And we know by looking at the code that that codes for threonine, THR. 
Alternatively, if you don't want to do it that way, you can just kind of skim through the letters to try to find ACU. Either would work on an exam. You will be provided a genetic code similar to this on, on the exam as well. I also want to point out the three stop codons, UAA, UAG, and UGA. You should know those. It's not a bad idea to commit those three to memory. And then we have one start codon here, AUG. It's not doesn't say start because it actually codes for an amino acid. But every messenger RNA that is translated in protein begins the translation process with AUG. Some other features of the code, you'll notice multiple codons, in this case two, AAU and AAC, coding for spare gene, ASN. You'll notice these four here coding for proline. You'll notice these six here code for leucine. The fact that we have multiple codons coding for the same amino acid, we call that degeneracy. We say that the code is degenerate in this way. Another way we could say that is that these codons, for instance, all these leucine ones, we would call those synonymous codons. So these two terms are really linked. Synonymous for the same and codon. So the, the codons themselves look different, but they code for the same amino acid. Another term we should define is wobble. So wobble explains these two terms here. The reason we have a degenerate code and the reason that synonymous codons can code for the same amino acids is because of the wobble effect. And we'll come back to this in a little bit when we talk about the tRNA binding to the messenger RNA. But if you notice, most of the time when we have multiple codons coding for the same amino acid, it's that third position that changes. So if you look at proline here, as long as the first two are CCs, cytosine, cytosines, it doesn't matter what that third codon is. It's always going to make proline. Same thing with arginine. As long as you have a CG, a cytosine guanine, it's still going to make arginine regardless of it. So we say this third base has a wobble effect. Another term associated with the code here is that it is universal, meaning all organisms use the same code. This I always find utterly amazing, right? That if you're looking at a bacteria or if you're looking at an elephant or a human, we're all reading our DNA using this same genetic code. Once this genetic code evolved, it maintained within our systems as evolution proceeded. Now, every time you use the word universal, you're asking for trouble, right? Whenever you say anything is universal, you know there's going to be some exceptions. And of course, there are a few exceptions to this universality of the genetic code. The few exceptions that are found aren't total exceptions, meaning that the places where we see exceptions, it doesn't replace the whole cold. It replaces part of it. So for instance, mitochondria, the mitochondrial genome, still uses this same genetic code, but in some species, for instance, this AUA, let's find that, AUA, instead of coding for isoleucine as we see here, in the mitochondria, in yeast and mammals, it codes for methionine. And there are a few other exceptions like that. But when it does switch this isoleucine to a methionine, the rest of the code stays the same. So it's still, so it's still a strong code. We also see some examples in mitochondria of other species. We see a few changes in protozoa, some protozoa. And we see some example changes in archaea and some in bacteria. And again, these changes are just changing one of the codons. So the rest of it stays the same. Let's go ahead and erase this so we can do some more writing here in this corner. And let's talk, let's talk about what a sense codon is and what a nonsense codon is. We'll start with nonsense. Nonsense codons are just another way to say stop codons. So anytime you see a nonsense codon, or we call something a nonsense codon, what you're really saying is that you've hit a stop codon. This will come back later when we start talking about mutations. What is a sense codon? A sense is everything else. So sense codons 
code for specific amino acids. So it's a generic term talking about all the other codons except the stop codons. It would also include the start codon because that um, codes for methionine. Okay, let's erase those now. And I want to redraw our messenger RNA, this up here. I draw it down here in, in a more generic term. So we have our five prime in, then we have the messenger R messenger RNA, and then we have our three prime in. We'll have our stop, I'm sorry, our start here and our stop here. It's important to remember that the messenger RNA doesn't just have the start and stop codon. It also has these, what we call, untranslated regions. So this is called the five prime untranslated region. And this over here is the three prime untranslated region. I don't have room to write untranslated region, but this is the three prime untranslated region. Now remember that these regions here are serve certain functions, but they do not make amino acids. And you will have several base pairs up above the start. And you'll have several downstream of the stop. So what might the purpose of these re regions be? Well, in bacteria, they help the, the five prime untranslated region is where the ribosome binds. And we'll talk more about that later. And though it's a little bit more complex in, in eukaryotes, this is also the site where that pre-initiation complex will bind to recruit the ribosome um, to initiate trans translation as well. And the three prime region is really important as well. And we could probably spend weeks talking about it. I know that sounds incredibly exciting, but it plays a very important role in gene expression. And it does this by affecting this messenger RNA's ability to leave the nucleus, the stability of this messenger RNA. Remember, this is where our poly A tail is going to be. It also contains elements in it, sequences in it, that allow it to be regulated by a class of other RNAs called microRNAs that we briefly talked about before. So both of these regions are important in making sure that this part here, this middle part, the reading frame, is actually translated into a protein. Okay, I'm going to erase this, this corner again. Now let's talk about how we're actually going to make a protein from this. And We'll go into more detail towards the, one of the later translation podcasts, but know that a tRNA is going to bind to each of these codons. And let's just, since we have a little bit of room here, let's pick CGU. A tRNA will bind something like this. And we'll talk about the structure of a tRNA in a little bit. We have this tRNA molecule, and it's going to recognize this codon. And as it recognizes this codon, it brings in a specific amino acid that matches this codon. So I'm going to redraw that down here where we have just a little bit more room to work with. So I'm just going to write the messenger RNA, C, G, U, and then we have the other sequences. Remember this is our three prime and this is our five prime. The tRNA, when it binds, let's go ahead and draw it again here. Again, it binds using the same anti-parallel rules. So this is five prime, this has to be three prime and this has to be five prime. This three prime in, we'll talk again about this later, but this is where the amino acid binds to. We've already identified this as the codon. And so the sequence here is going to be the anti-codon. I'm gonna draw that, or write that over here, anti-codon. And we're going to follow the same base pair complementary rules, the Chargaff rules, when we do this. So C is going to be a G. G will bind to a C, and U will bind to an A. So if we look over here at our code, CGU, and we find it, we have CGU, that's an arginine. Arginine, my favorite amino acid. Okay, well, one of my favorite amino acids. It's hard to have a favorite but arginine. Okay, let's go ahead and replace that amino acid with the actual correct amino acid, and it's A, R, G. And that's going to be attached to this three prime. So on an exam, I could give you the anticodon, which would be five prime to three prime, A, C, G. Or I could give you the codon, which would be, again, five prime to three prime, C, G, U. 
With either of these, you should be able to tell me that it codes for arginine, or any of the, I could give any one of the other codons and anticodons. If I give you the codon, well that's simple, you just use the code. But if I give you this one, you must know to first convert it back to the messenger RNA in its five prime to three prime direction, and then use the code. I love to ask this question on an exam. Maybe not with arginine, but with something else. Now let's start making this protein. And what you want to do is, remember, in this five prime untranslated region, there could be hundreds of base pairs present before you start translating. And so the key is to go through all those base pairs until you find your first AUG. I made this one fairly simple because I don't have a lot of room here, but it's our, our, it starts here at the fourth position. Now, there's nothing to say that the bases before this have to be in three base pair codons. This could be 11 bases, or it could be 17 bases. It doesn't have to be in multiples of three. You'll go through that region until you find your first AUG, and here it is, AUG. And that's where we're going to begin translation. This defines our reading frame. Now, we can, now if you want to practice this on your own, you can hit pause and then complete it on your own and then hit play and see if you are correct. All right, as we begin to translate this, we have to point out one important rule, and that is all protein sequences begin with an amino group. We'll explain why in a little bit. We begin with this amino group. Then we look at our code, AUG, that codes for methionine. So let's write methionine. And then UUU codes for phenylalanine. Then CAU, CAU codes for histidine. I'm out of room here, so I'm going to have to wrap it around here. And then ACU, ACU makes threonine, one of my least favorite amino acids. CGU then codes for our good friend arginine. And then UAA. And you'll see UAA is one of our three stop codons. Now, never, never do what I'm about to show you here, because A, you'll make me sad, and I don't like to be sad, and you'll lose points. Never write the word stop. Bad idea. And the reason for that is the word stop never, ever appears in the sequence of, an amino, of a protein. It's not an amino acid sequence. The word does not exist on a protein sequence. So let's get rid of it. Pretend we never did that. But it's important to know that just like we began with an NH3, we end with something unique too. And that's a carboxyl group, a COO minus. These are important because they distinguish when, what the beginning of the amino acid sequence is and what the end is. Just like our RNAs begin with pri five prime and end with three prime. One other point to make out here, I didn't have room to show it, but remember there's gonna be a lot of extra sequences here in that three prime untranslated region but we stop at the stop and we don't write, write the word stop. If you had this on an exam and you wrote just this, like this, you get full credit. On an exam, it's very common for me to give you one of the DNA strands first and then have you come up with a protein sequence to work, so, to, so you have to work through all the different stages. Now, once this protein is made, it has to fold in different structures. And let's talk about that real quick on this podcast before we um, close it. The first structure of proteins we should mention is the primary. Sometimes we'll call this like so. This is the linear sequence of the protein. So you'll have your NH3, then you'll have a string of amino acids, met, his, uh, glutamic acid, arginine, and then, and then your carboxyl group. This is the primary sequence. It is defined or held together, I should say, by these bonds, and these are called peptide bonds. Peptide bonds. The primary structure is non-functional. Next, let's talk about our secondary structure. And we'll often just call it like that. It's important to remember before we talk about the secondary then the tertiary is that even though this primary doesn't have a function, its sequence helps dictate how the protein will, will fold in the secondary and tertiary forms. The secondary 
we'll call regional folding. And it will form one of several kinds of secondary structures, but the two you should know include the alpha helix and the beta sheets. You won't have to draw these, but if you look in your textbook, you'll see examples of them, and you should be able to recognize them. The alpha helix is just something like this, and the beta sheet we often draw like this. So the protein, a given, any given protein, may have several different secondary structures within it. It is often characterized by, or held together, I should say, by hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are really important. Now, I'm going to write usually non-functional. I say usually because certain proteins in a secondary structure have a function. And the, the most important one that you should probably know are the prions. If you've heard of prion diseases, these are like the mad cow disease or chronic wasting disease in deer that sometimes we'll, we'll see in Michigan. These proteins don't fold beyond the secondary. They only for, fold by the, into, into the secondary structure. And they're infectious. One of the few agents that are infectious that are just a protein. Not a virus or anything like that, just a protein. Okay, let's talk about the tertiary structure next. And I'm going to erase some of this here just to give me some room. The tertiary structure, sometimes written like that, this is the fully folded protein. It is certainly functional. And you've seen me before when I write a protein structure, I'll usually draw it as this kind of mass here. And that's usually what happens, they fold upon themselves. The secondary structure still pretty much, when you look at it, looks like a linear array of, of sequences, though there is some local folding. This looks like a, a glob of amino acids, but a very functional glob of amino acids. It is primarily characterized by hydrophobic forces. And we want to come back to this when I have a little bit more room to write on the board. But, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely come back to it because it's one of the most important features of a, of a protein's function. Okay. And then the last one we want to talk about are the quaternary structures. And while I'm at it, I should point out that every single protein has a primary structure and a secondary structure. Almost all proteins have a tertiary structure. The notable exceptions would be the prions. However, not all proteins have a quaternary structure. And I'm running out of room here, but let's draw the hemoglobin molecule we drew before, where we had the two alpha subunits here and then the two beta subunits here. So a quaternary protein is composed of multiple subunits, often coded for by different genes. They are then held together to give that protein function. For instance, the hemoglobin, any one of these subunits by themselves, is not functional. These are often characterized by ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, um, I'll write it here, we call these di sulfide bonds. There can be some hydrophobic interactions as well. So a lot of things can hold these quaternary structures together. Not, not covalent bonds, but they're more weaker associations. Van der Waals would, would um, fit in here as well. Now I want to come back to hydrophobic forces, but I need to erase all this first. It's important to note that every single amino acid looks has a, has a similar structure. We have an amino group here, we have a carbon here, and then we have a carboxyl group at the end. We also have a hydrogen here. Now what makes an amino acid different from another amino acid is what we call this R group. This is the functional group. Now this R group 
makes that amino acid fall into one of a few categories. That R group could make an amino acid nonpolar. It could make it polar. It could make it aromatic, meaning it has a ring structure to it. These polar amino acids could either be neutral, like I wrote here, or I'm writing here. They could also be polar acidic, which means they have a negative charge on them. They could also be polar and they're basic, meaning they have a positive amino, a positive charge on them. And your book mentions some of these, of these non-standard amino acids, but we're not going to worry about those. It's important for you to know that these five groups of amino acids exist. You don't need to know which amino acids fall into these categories. I suspect you'll learn that in biochemistry if you take biochemistry. But for now, you should know that these five exist. You should also know where they would be at in a protein, particularly a folded up protein. So we'll draw one in its tertiary structure. In this tertiary structure, remember there, I mentioned that term hydrophobic forces. Nonpolar we can also think of as being hydrophobic. We can think of the polar ones over here as being hydrophilic. So our hydrophobic ones are going to be in the middle of that protein. They're trying to, for lack of a better way of saying it, move away from the water. They're avoiding that water. So they're going to be in the middle. So I'm going to put a one here in the middle of the protein not exposed to the outside of the protein. I put a one there because that matches up over here. On the outside of the protein, that's where we're going to find, on the outside of the protein, that's where we're going to find our polar amino acids, particularly our acidic and basic ones. So I'm going to put fours around here. And that's because they need to interact with water and other molecules. For instance, when it forms a, a quaternary structure, these polar amino acids maybe what is linking the two um, subunits together. So it's very important to know nonpolar amino acids are in the middle of the protein. Polar amino acids are on the outside of the protein. While we, while we have this um, beautiful drawing written here, let's take this opportunity to explain why we, be, why we begin in a, a protein se sequence with NH3 and we end it with COO minus. As this amino acid chain is growing, are added to this COON. So the next amino acid that is attached here binds here. And you keep doing this till you get to the end. And when you add that last amino acid to this protein sequence, it's always going to have that COO minus at the end, the carboxyl group at the end. We don't add to this end, so this is always going to be at the beginning of a protein. Okay, this was a particularly longer podcast, but I think all of this kind of tied nicely together, so I didn't want to break it up. But I think we are done with it. So let's close with a quick summary. You should know the various features of the genetic code. We talked about several things. We talked about what the nonsense codons were, what the sense codons were. We talked about the, the three nonsense codons, also called stop codons. We talked about the start codon. We talked about some features of the genetic code. We talked about it being universal. We talked about it being degenerate. We talked about it coding for synonymous amino acids. We talked about a few exceptions, and mo most of those exceptions were found in, in specific mitochondria, as well as protozoa and some archaea and bacteria. But you should also appreciate that the code is, by and large, very universal. We also talked about how that wobble effect allows the code to be degenerate. Next, we talked about reading the messenger RNA to make a protein. And remember that we had this long nucleotide sequence and we had to get past those five, that 5' five untranslated region. You should also know why that's important. And then we looked for that very first AUG. And once we found that AUG, we started plugging in amino acids until we got to one of the three stop codons. Once we got there, we ended that sequence with a COO minus, a carboxyl group. And again, remember the front of it is an, an amino group. like so, with all of the amino acids here in between. Then we ended with talking about protein structure.
talk about the four different forms, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. You should know which ones exist in all proteins, or almost all proteins. You should know which kinds of chemical bonds characterize that particular uh, level of protein folding. And then you should know the basic structure of an amino acid that we talked about very end. So we'll say the last thing here, amino acid classification. That is what may, that, that is that amino acids are either polar, nonpolar, aromatic, or polar neutral. And that these characteristics allow that protein to fold in a proper way where we have charges on the outside of the protein and hydrophobic or, or nonpolar amino acids on the inside of that protein. Well, that ends this podcast. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come talk to me. If not, I'll see you in class. Bye.